So let me introduce to you um, the next two speakers. Um, my first speaker will be Saigen Yeltsin, and he's a founder of, of and the CEO at uh, sellanycar.com. He's also founder of sukar.com, a private shopping site, partner at the Jabbar Internet Group, and partner at souq.com Group, a large e-commerce company. Mr. Yelchin is an academic lecturer on entrepreneurship and e-commerce at the Canadian University of Dubai. He has been active in promoting entrepreneurship and early stage venture capital activities in the UAE. Mr. Yelchin holds an international master's degree in business administration and economics, and he studied at WHU Otto Bynchem School of Management, University of South Carolina, and this is a difficult one of Mexico, but it's Instituto Tecnologico Autonomo de Mexico. There we go. Mr. Shelton, please take the floor. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I just uh, arrived from Dubai and I have only 10 minutes, so I'm gonna keep it very, very short. And I hope we can discuss the details you wanna go into uh, after that. So in general, we're gonna just fly over these slides. So what are SMEs? And I'm gonna use SMEs as startups. Let's call them startups. And I'm gonna show why we really need startups in the Middle East and what the benefits, and especially the economic benefits, are by creating an environment which is supporting startups. And you have answered the major questions already, and I, I'm very happy because these are actually exactly the two choices I made, A and D, and I'm actually gonna come, I think A and E, and I'm gonna come to the details now. So what is a startup? Usually they say a startup is a young company with 250, some define it as less than 500 employees or team members. But for me, actually, a startup is a mindset. And it is basically this. It's a backpack. It's, this is what I had when I came to Dubai around four and a half years ago. And all I had was basically this idea and this vision. We want to create one of the first uh, online private shopping clubs, or actually one of the first relatively well-funded uh, e-commerce ventures, and there weren't really a, f a lot of them back then. So this is always what I use as a symbol to say you don't really need everything we have just discussed in the questions, right? These are things we really want to achieve, but the first, the major thing is always comes from the entrepreneur, is the mindset. So having said that, let's go to the economical benefits later on, what we actually could achieve if we reach these, if we basically bridge this need so I'm not going to talk too much about myself. Uh, we have already heard a bit about it. So I just wanted to say that I was involved in the and in one of the biggest e-commerce ventures in the region. I'm still partner with, with a couple of holdings which are involved in e-commerce in the Middle East. So this was actually my first office. Looks great. It's just actually a, a restaurant with free Wi-Fi. That's actually three months where we worked in. And it was, uh, it was where we hired the first people, where we wrote the business plan, and where we actually uh, attracted venture capital and the first team members, lying on both sides, saying to the investors that we have the team already, <laughs> saying to the team that we already have the financing. So we were actually trying to bridge the situation. And again, this is still from an entrepreneurial po point of view, and I'm always going to talk from this point of view, even though I know that most in the audience are actually on the other side, on the investor side, I believe, I hope, I assume. <clears throat> so let's just jump to it. So startups grow. Startups grow from one to thousands of employees, and I've been part of it, and I've seen it. I can actually vouch for that, what great uh, benefits we can achieve in the economical point of view. So if you look at it, startups are everywhere, and startups are actually 99.8% of all, all, when I say startups, SMEs, of all companies in the world. And if you look at it in the Middle East, you see huge numbers of portions in terms of GDP, portions in terms of employment, and portions in general of being uh, in companies, a number of companies. So in the UAE, for example, 60% of, of, 
of the workforce and 75% of GDP. And if we look at it, mature markets are actually a good example. If you see it, 99.8% in the EU27 are startups or SMEs. And 67% of them, uh, actually 67% of all employment comes from these companies. And 58% of all gross value added. So what could actually a startup or an SME, SME lead to? It's job creation. This is actually what the region needs. If you look at it, the population under 24 years old in KSA is 57%. In the UAE, it's 35%. If you look at the countries which are really suffering from unemployment, it's even higher. It's 50% in G Egypt, in Jordan, and in Lebanon, it's 40%. These countries really need job creation. And job creation comes through SMEs. So there's more. Because if you look at specifically in the GCC, we are very much relying on the oil sector, right? And startups and SMEs are actually a very great tool to deviate from this focus and create new things. It doesn't have to be new products. It could be just a product which is copied from a mature market to a Middle Eastern market. The other one is actually the more SMEs we have, the better competition we have, the price lowering effects we will have, and quality improving effects we will have on the, on, the, on the economy. Last but not least, startups usually are the ones which can also employ people in rural areas, and actually covering small parts of the country where usually big conglomerates don't get to. So having said that, we really need SMEs to uh, achieve economical prosperity. So if you look at it in the MENA region, the SME 250, 57% of all contribution to employment, 62% if you take the SME 500. But if you ask the entrepreneurs, or if you ask the people what actually hinders you from achieving success, most of them say the same thing. It's access to finance. And I can vouch for that. I have gone through this, and I'm still going through this Headache, and what is actually a pity is it's not only the investor's fault, I would call it. First and foremost, what we see is management capacity from entrepreneurs. We need education, and we need to show why we are worth investing, why we are worth investment, all right? So the second part is, great, we have a tax-free region in the GCC mostly, but the cost of startups, again, the flat fees are relatively high for small entrepreneurs uh, who are just starting probably out of their own pocket. The, the other point is processing time in certain countries. It just, it just takes too much time or it's a headache. Very important also the legal judicial system is not strong in terms of pr protecting your intellectual property. And last but not least, of course, financing, access to financing. But what I really see as a problem is the criminalization of debt. If you can't take risk without fearing jail, that is a huge issue for entrepreneurs. It's gonna hinder you from achieving this economical prosperity I was just talking about. At the end of the day, you gotta fear that you, if you fail with your business plan and you can't pay back the loans you might get, your check is gonna bounce and you're gonna to go to jail. This is a huge problem we need to learn from mature markets. I know Kuwait has been working on it, and they have actually finalized a law, but they have never implemented it. UAE is still working on it. I see most of the Middle Eastern countries that, we, that they still don't have a strong judicial system dealing with uh, financial debt, especially out of entrepreneurial uh, endeavors. So banks don't finance startups period, in the Middle East, it's definitely a headache. I actually have been talking with banks, and the reason why they don't invest is, of course, the risky and small cash flows. We have the lack of collateral, but more importantly, we don't have a credit history system. So the banks don't actually know who they're who they dealing with. Say, so, well, is this guy trustworthy or not? They don't know. There's no system which is tracking your credit worthiness. And of course, as a startup, you don't have a bank relationship, right? So you're probably just not gonna get any loans, if you need loans. So this is what I have been working on. I have marked those 
fields where I'm actually active in, I'm actually uh, trying to educate uh, students who are willing to become entrepreneurs. I try to awaken it. I'm trying to show them tools how to bridge an idea to reality. Right? And I'm also promoting regional venture capital because I believe we really need investors. And if I look at it, there's probably maybe a handful of them who can bridge the following. So we have a great market. We have ways to identify if an idea is good or not. These are questions we always ask in, in class. We have tools to make business plans, all great. We have sources of capital, but where do we actually get money from? If you look at it, so we have seed early, expansion late, and IPO. There has not been an e-commerce IPO ever in the Middle East. There is going to be probably in the next two to three years, I assume, but where do we actually get stuck in the Middle East is where it says A, right? Seed is still possible. Seed you can get from your friends, from your family, from, from yourself, from your bank account. But if you then show it works, you need money which helps you grow. This is where we get stuck. There's only a handful of investors, especially in the e-commerce sphere, who are willing to invest more than maybe half a million, more than a million, but usually the money doesn't come from this region. We have raised a lot of money in the past four to five years. But none of it, and not not, but a very small percentage of it comes actually from the people who should have invested because they're the first to, to see the opportunity. But they don't realize it because Americans, South Africans, Europeans, these are the ones who have witnessed success in this industry and they have a lower challenge to invest. Five minutes? One minute. Yeah. One no, you're over by three minutes, so. Really? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> well, <laughs> we shall continue the conversation. Please have a seat. So first question I have is uh, to you, uh, Yasin. Uh, how are, uh, or you are in fact very optimistic, the questioner says, about SMEs, but how do you explain the 70 to 80% failure rate in SMEs during the first one um, to third year. Can we do something about it? Is it done through better education? Thank you for the question. It's a very, very important question. Um, seven to 80% failure rate is actually really good, first of all. But yes, we can do a lot about it. We discussed it. The management capacity, the entrepreneurs, are enjoying, or actually the education they're enjoying is not sufficient. There is no institution, or I would say a very minority of institutions actually focus and emphasize entrepreneurship and uh, business, business uh, creation. Now, uh, that's probably what we can do. As I said, we need also an infrastructure which is supporting that from a judicial point of view. People are actually scared to, to open up their own company because they got, might end up in jail. This is a huge problem. We need to solve that. And uh, once you get the money, I said seed capital is, is fine, you might get it. But then what next? You might have achieved a partial proven concept. You might be on the uh, edge of actually achieving something, but then you get stuck at Series A because you need money and no one is actually believing in you because there is a high failure rate, there is no infrastructure which is supporting it, there is no real uh, success story, or not a lot of success stories which, which you can actually uh, base your decision on. So I think it's, it's, it's a collective uh, collection of factors which we need to influence in order to achieve. Uh, you tell me, I was fascinated by what you said about some countries, including Kuwait, I think you mentioned, who are studying what to do, what kind of things to do, uh, to avoid jail, as you put it, the, f the financial failure leading to, to jail. Have uh, you heard them speak of good ideas? Have you given them any good ideas? Are you talking to people in your field? And please come in on that question. Uh, but let me start uh, to, with, with uh, Saigon to, to tell me what, I mean, there what's is a going lot on there. And who else other than Kuwait is involved with that? Kuwait hasn't implemented it yet. Mm -hmm. They have been working on it. What I'm saying is governments, 
I'm not saying governments are not supporting entrepreneurship. There is a lot going on in the UAE. There is actually a lot of government-supported entrepreneurial programs where you can sign up, mostly for locals, but it's a good start. So you will get money, and you will get probably uh, maybe 200,000 dirhams, maybe $250,000 maximum, and then you can solve the first problems. But it still has nothing to do with the criminalization of the debt. Right, so talk about that. This is exactly what I wanted to understand. Talk about the criminalization of the debt. Are there ideas to deal with that that exist in Western economies, Western uh, countries that it was, are it, possibly a model for this region? Or is, does this region need a different model? 1876 in UK, criminalization of debt was actually pro-entrepreneurship. That's when they implemented it. So I think there is a lot of a uh, lot of great examples, especially in Europe and uh, in the U.S., where you where we can uh, just copy. Mm. And I see there is a, there is a movement, but it's not in this specific sphere of of the uh, judicial system. And we come in on that. Sure. I mean, I'm much more basic in my thinking. I mean, so first of all, on the on the on the failure side, for whoever asked about the failure side, I mean, it's a good sign because that means people are thinking big. And we need people to think big. Uh, we need to go from startups to scale-ups. And for them to go from startups to scale-ups, they need to think big. That's the reality of it. I, I think on the point of, of all of the mitigating factors, there's a lot that can be done to support entrepreneurship. I, I'm still a believer that the first thing we need to do is actually to believe, to sincerely believe that entrepreneurship is, a, is, 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 is the future of this region. Uh, with that, I'm not worried about the fear factor of failure of, uh, uh, from illegal and all of these. I have yet to meet an entrepreneur that actually cares about what happens when he goes bankrupt. I mean, just genuinely speaking. I, I think these things are a bit you, more... What do you mean? Really, they don't care if they go I, bankrupt? I, I, and they, I, I, I mean, I, I, is, does that I, not encourage uh, you know, rash uh, behavior that, all right, I'll just try it, I, I fail, you know, yeah, there's no accountability? I think, as, I think, I think as, as organisms, as people, we are, we're much more pragmatic than we're given credit for. I mean, I think... There's a lot of structuring that's done around us, but we tend to navigate towards doing the right things and doing the responsible things. Most of the entrepreneurs that I have worked with and that I have, you know, have, haven't started a venture thinking about what is the legal ramification of this not working out when I get to point B or to point C or point D. I think the changes in the laws as it pertains to these things will accelerate our ability to get failed entrepreneurs back into the system. And I'll give you an example with Jordan. We probably have you know, X number of SMEs listed as registered in Jordan. It's because the, most of them are probably shut down. It's just they don't have the money to actually go through the formal process of refiling, you know, filing for bankruptcy in the proper, in the proper methodology. So making, you know, clearing that, cleaning that up will allow mm -hmm. us to get these people back into the system from what they've learned to be able to build new and better ventures. So again, um, the question is put in a way, I think you answered it, but I'm gonna uh, put it in the way it was written. Isn't startup, finance and activity inhibited by what they put in quotation, fear of failure, particularly in the Middle East. Is this, this is, do you believe that, that startup finance and activities are, are inhibited by the fear of failure? It depends on the kind of uh, investor. The venture capitalist, he's definitely aware of the, uh, of the failure rates and he's gonna invest accordingly. Banks, definitely, they will not support it if there's a bit of a risk premium which you can add on startups. So I believe it really depends who's investing. But um, in the Middle East, if you look at the venture capital scene, if there is some which is significant, um, you will see that there are professionals. And I will still say that it's not a lot. It's probably five to 10 maximum mm -hmm. which you can take seriously in terms of building great and big ventures. And then there is investors who are putting their money and comparing a startup to a real estate investment uh -huh. or to, to some, and say I could get 8% there and maybe 50% from this investment, but it's more risky. Looking at it this way is completely wrong. And this is, I cannot blame these investors because they haven't seen what an investment into the e-commerce sphere can actually lead to. That's why our money comes from outside the region uh -huh. because these people, uh, in the U.S., they have seen it. So they say, well, if it works here, I just take this product and put it into this region. These people also eat and drive and wear clothes, so it's probably going to work. So their hurdle is just uh, the timing. They say, is it the right time to invest now? 
not is e-commerce or internet investment in general or startup investment in general working? This question has been answered. So the only question is timing and uh, product market fit. Mm. Uh, I have, uh, uh, this question I think is to both, but let me uh, take it to, um, um, who do I take it to? I think I take it to Emil. Any idea how much SMEs in MENA participate in GDP per capita? Yeah. I don't know, this is the question. Anybody wants to read it? Maybe I... I'll give it to you as the academic. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm not a statistics guy. I, in, I yes, it's in one of my slides, actually. Uh, we okay. can distribute. I think it's uh, mm -hmm. GDP must be 75% or something. But please look it up. I don't memorize these numbers, but it's one of the... It's, it's a significant number. So, so I'll Would answer I, this question mm -hmm. in a different way. Can I answer this question in a different sure. way? I mean, the way to think about SMEs, right, and, and particularly scale-ups, is that from t on average from 25 to 95 percent of new jobs are created through these types of companies? So I don't know what they contribute today. What I'm looking at the gap in terms of the number of jobs we need to create and where the focus needs to be, just for us to be, you know, safe and secure in terms of creating a sustainable environment as as economies in this part of the world. Investing in uh, startups and scale, and more importantly, I'll probably say scale ups, but both startups and scale ups. Uh, there's just no question about their contribution from a net job creation. It's not where we are today, it's where we want to be in the future, is what I would say. Would any, uh, either one of you be interested in investing in sectors other than technology? Yeah. Such as? Yeah, look, I think there's a lot of knowledge-based industries. I mean, I, I think there's, you know, t t you know uh, uh, the creative sector as an example, for those that are into crowdsource financing, on Eureka today, you can go and see Joe Bedou, a Jordanian company that over the last three days has already raised $77,000 uh, and, you know, uh, participate, you know, with the Jordanian, participate within it, with, with in it by investing a small amount, I don't care how much, $200 into an SME, you'll get a feel of what it's about. Other sectors, I mean, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of emerging knowledge-based sectors that provide a heck of a lot of opportunity. As a venture capitalist, our thought process is really on knowledge because that's where value creation is scalable for us, where one guy can create the equivalent of 20,000 people just because of the way they've, uh, uh, you know, they have uh, no limitations on access to borders and the, way, and the way knowledge creates value in and of itself, how scalable it is. Uh, but I would say there are other sectors. I think some of the stuff that's happening in the clean tech space is really, really exciting in the region. Again, I go back to the creative sector. Uh, across the board, so th I think there's a lot of areas. I in the pure SME space, there's so much opportunity for us in the hospital. Anything related to lifestyle is an enormous opportunity from an SME base. Sagan, would you be interested sorry, sorry. in uh, investing in other than technology? Uh, let me answer it uh, in, in two points. First of all, I'll, I see myself as an entrepreneur. Yes, I would definitely invest outside uh, technology as well, but the uh, part of investment I really focus on, I would focus on, is where I have an understanding and where I can mm -hmm. add more yeah. than just money. And uh, I believe I'm strongest or my strength is in technology, mm -hmm. is in e-commerce and internet business in the region. That's why I would, would not like to deviate from it. But I have uh, heard great ideas which were completely offline and uh, I looked into it. But for me to add value there is more difficult. Can I add one point? Sure. Just to, just to make the point on this, I mean, we need to think about what technology means today, right? I mean, technology is a horizontal. Every venture has technology. And, and I think most of the startups that I see today are actually solving traditional problems, okay, using technology. So it, they are a, a migration of traditional uh, 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 ch uh, challenges, leveraging technology into moving these forward. So most of them today, there isn't a, you know, a synon what is it, suffix, prefix. There isn't a prefix with tech. You know, you can see real, real estate tech, you can see ed tech, you can see med tech. Every sector has a tech component addition to it. And if you dig into these companies, you'll find most of them are just leveraging technology, but their core business model is built around a traditional uh, 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 non kind of like tech defined uh, 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 model. Yeah, uh, stay with it, uh, Emil. Why is venture capital focused on technology sector above others? Uh, again, it's just the scalability. I think, you know, we're Duckwalk, a company here in Jordan we've invested into, right, does translation. His market is anywhere, any SME in the world. I mean, this is the singular benefit that he has. He doesn't have to worry. I mean, 
We're, why are we focused on local to global? Maybe just to address that for a second. It's just the regional market is so inefficient. I mean, just to sit and to deal with a visa, to go into Saudi Arabia or to go into Kuwait, I mean, it's just complete nonsense. I mean, just fundamentally nonsense for somebody that's trying to build something up. Changing a, the way a, a platform looks you know, to fit this, this particular market or this particular market, highly, highly inefficient in general, right? Technology gives us the ability to break out of all of this. I can sit here and serve the island of Manhattan, right, which is probably more efficient as an economy, you know, than these entrepreneurs. Just one, you know, one uh, city block in Manhattan probably has more economic opportunity than one Arab country for these guys, right? just simply because of the efficiency, mm -hmm. you know, the efficiency in decision making and getting things done. These are the opportunities, I think, from a change perspective. We need to open these opportunities up locally for our own entrepreneurs because everybody else is taking them. I mean, when the U.S. comes in and provides 70,000 visas for immigrants to do startups, who are they targeting? They're targeting our best and brightest. Let, let me take the same, a similar question that was actually to Emil, but I'm going to give it to you because I think he already answered it. Uh, until now, it is, it, it's really, you know why I said that. It says, until now, most, if not all, of the MENA VC venture capital investments has been in tech startups. Why? And I think you already answered that. Go ahead, please, yes. It's where we have the biggest opportunity. Yeah. I mean, when I came uh, to Dubai in 2009, I was shocked by the numbers. Actually, I was shocked before, that's why I came. I looked at the internet penetration rate, and I saw that there are, back then, 65 million people online in the MENA region. We have a market of 250 million people. Uh, this number was growing, actually, by, I think, 9,000% in the last, uh, nine years, so from 2000 to 2009. So the broadband penetration was actually huge. So what was missing was now, we, I always believe in two things. You have a great audience and you have a great product. You put them together, you will have a great business. Now, I said, okay, there's the audience, but there's not enough product we can offer. So there was a lack in supply. So I believe we have so many working business models outside the region, which we just need to a copy to this region, and the most successful ones are those, mm. the ones which actually already exist, but not for the Middle East or from the Middle Eastern people, and that's why I believe it makes much more sense to invest there. Uh, Emil, as an investor, what's my exit strategy from VC investments in the MENA region? Right, I mean, a great question. Obviously, you hear it every day, just as a concept, right? I think, first of all, we need to understand this region needs patient capital, right? I mean, let's make no mistake about it. Any perception that knowledge is going to generate an exit, uh, knowledge-based businesses are going to generate an exit within the coming three years, that's, we, I mean, that's, I mean if, if that's the outlook, it, you shouldn't be looking at it. What we have to realize is globally, right, when we're looking at exit markets, these things fundamentally take time. An average life cycle of a fund, most of the people that I have spoken to, right, you're talking about nine years, even in the US. I mean, there's nothing that's mind-numbingly shocking that these ventures take time to develop and to grow. In our region, it takes longer. Do they create value? They create enormous value. I mean, just, we've lived this experience, right? As it relates to exits, I think as we integrate more and more, as we open up ourselves first, too, and as we integrate more and more with the world, these things, are start these things will start to happen in and of themselves. You don't sell a company, people buy great companies. We need to focus on building great companies. And we need to focus on creating a great market collectively across the region that will interest people to come and acquire these businesses. I mean, just as a point. Yeah. But I mean, you have more... I, I would add yeah. something from an yeah. entrepreneurial point of view. I see, uh, first of all, we shouldn't, as an entrepreneur, just look at an exit strategy yeah. when we start a company. But what I also see is there is there is this lack of focus on profitability in, in internet ventures. I mean, we just happen to accept that we will burn money for the last next seven years and just don't really care about why we're burning so much money. So I can say I was a really bad CEO, the first company I've built, and uh, I just thought money will come because we can burn, and the burn rate is accepted to be this high. But at the same time, uh, over the years, I have learned that really we need to think of, in terms of from the, from the venture capitalist point of view as well. If the entrepreneur just loses focus on profitability and just figures out that 
your contribu contribution margins does, don't make sense anymore. <laughs> I think this is also some kind of a lack of management capacity. Just we, we see that entrepreneurs forget about profitability, especially in the tech scene. And we shouldn't just take the US as an example that money-burning companies can mm. create exit values of $20 billion. I have a question to you because you spoke of education. And the question is, uh, uh, what specifically must be taught? And then after that, I'm going to conclude with two questions to the two of you. And has, that has to be done in two minutes. So the, f the question is, it m what must be taught specifically six, when you speak of six, education? Six segments I cover is uh, entrepreneurship, spir the entrepreneurial spirit, what it is actually. Idea evaluation, right? I am one of the slowest guys before I start a venture. I look into every single question I might have, right? We have six major questions we cover, but I don't want to go into details. Then we have business planning. Not the text part, the numbers part. Just make sure that the numbers make sense. If your best case scenario is $10 million, probably you're not going to find venture capitalists. Financing, right? Who's going to pay for this? Team and business intelligence. And this covers actually from the spirit to the idea to step by step, from planning to financing to team building, and then actually the first 90 days of the company working, so business intelligence. These are the six segments I would focus on. Excellent. Now, can you, uh, the two of you, I'm going to combine uh, two questions, uh, and this, that will be uh, the last two questions I could get in, uh, despite the, the my wish that we had longer time, but so the questions are as follows. How can we bridge the gap between SMEs and investors looking for new investment options? And the second question is uh, this. If I have a new project idea, is this idea? Does this say idea? Data. Is this data or idea? Oh gosh, I'm mm -hmm. writing. Mm -hmm. If I have a new project uh, idea, it seems to me, and the banks don't finance it, how can I start up my project? So, how do you do it without money? Um, let's do it uh, starting with you and concluding with you. Okay, okay? go ahead. The first so, one was bridging. The first one was, uh, how can we bridge uh, the gap between SMEs and investors looking for new investment options? And the second one I is mean, that if I have a new project and the banks don't want to finance it, how can I start up my project? Again, uh, this is not, nothing we should invent. It already exists. There are great platforms where venture capitalists can meet uh, new entrepreneurs and ideas. It could be crowdfunding. It could also be uh, a website like AngelList, right? It's a platform where venture capitalists and investors and angels are signing up and where entrepreneurs are actually signing up. So I believe it's just communication. Besides the fact that there are not a lot of venture capitalists in the region, right? This is a fundamental issue we need to solve. Let's assume we have a lot of investors and we actually change the mentality of investing, then it's just a matter of communication and uh, building platforms, which is again based on technology, to, to establish this bridge. Yeah, I mean, for that question, I would say, you know, uh, you'd be amazed at how much there is around you if you open your eyes and you look in terms of funding opportunities and how quickly the landscape is changing on a daily basis. Uh, you know, don't wait for anybody. Uh, don't wait for politicians. Don't wait for government. Don't wait for financiers. In the classic definition of financiers, um, I used one example, which is the crowdsource funding today. Uh, I think what I've learned in my life, you'd be amazed how friends, how supportive friends and family can be to get you started. And also, you'd be amazed, you know, to S Sagan's point, you know, just reach out to. If it's a tech venture, just as a point, using that as an example, reach out to local, regional, and global uh, accelerators. I mean, I've seen people go out of uh, uh, you know, a small, uh, 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 let's just call it a garage, like a cafe in, in Amman, go straight to an accelerator in, in Palo Alto or in San Francisco or in uh, Sweden and, and wherever. I mean, there is a demand today. There is enormous demand for talent. There's an enormous demand for new ideas. So. Uh, do that. For the other one about how do I get started from zero, I mean, one easy example is apply to Oasis 500. I mean, that's, or start an accelerator in your neighborhood. I mean, it's, there is that much opportunity out there. Emil Kubaisi, Saigon Yeltsin, uh, we have had many requests for copies of your presentations. Uh, what is the best way for people to contact you after today? 
can you, do, do you want to say it out uh, here uh, so uh, that people could contact you to get your presentations? So E-M-I-L-E -E at uh, silicon, S-I-L-I-C-O-N, uh, B-A-D-I-A, siliconbadia.com. Yeah, and Twitter is just EQAC. Uh, feel free to reach out at any time. Happy to share anything. We'd love to host you guys at our offices, whoever would ever be interested to learn more. And whoever wants to pitch their venture, I hope some of you do. Knock on the door at any time. Or else go support an entrepreneur. It would be great. I'm sure most of you guys already do this. I think we're preaching to convert it. But if you can mentor an entrepreneur, if you can spend some time with somebody that's starting up a venture, you've done something fantastic. Good for you. Good for you. Go ahead, your contacts. Uh, email I would uh, suggest as well. It's my first name, Saigon. That's Sugar Anthony Yankee Germany India Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a combination. So we know there's a Nancy in your life, there's a Germany in your life. How's Nancy? <laughs> it's part of my name. <laughs> All right. At speed, like fast, lane, like fast lane, capital.com. Speed lane capital. You got that? Okay. What a pleasure to have young men who are changing the world in a very lovely way. Thank you for joining oh, thank us. You thank, you. thank 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 you.